ಭದ್ರಂಕರ್ಣೇಭ್ಯಸೃನುಯಾಮ ದೇವಾ ಭದ್ರಂ ಪಶ್ಯೇಮಾಕ್ಷಭೀರ್ಯಜತ್ರ ಸ್ಥಿರೈರಂಗೈಸ್ತುಷ್ಟುವಾಗಂಸನೂಭಿ ವ್ಯಶೇಮ ದೇವಿ ತಂಯದಾಯು ಸ್ವಸ್ತೀನ ಇಂದ್ರೋ ವೃದ್ಧಸ್ರವಾ ಸ್ವಸ್ತೀನ ಪೂಷಾ ವಿಶ್ವೇದ ಸ್ವಸ್ತೀನಸ್ತಾಕ್ಷೋ ಅರಿಷ್ಟನೇಮಿ ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ನೋ ಬೃಹಸ್ಪತಿರ್ದಾತು ಓಂ ಶಾಂತ ಶಾಂತ ಶಾಂತಿ ಹರಿ may we hear with our ears what is auspicious may we see with our eyes what is auspicious while praying with steady limbs may we attain the life span allotted to us may indra bestow well being on us may pushan the god of earth who is all knowing bestow well being on us may garura the destroyer of evil bestow well being on us may brihaspati also bestow well being on us om shanti 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 so in the last class we started our discussion on the third mantra of the first chapter of first part of mundaka upanishad and there we saw that after enunciating the lineage the parampara but following which the knowledge of brahman the brahma vidya was transmitted from brahma himself to the shaunaka that lineage which is uh, to angirasa the lineage which was followed was being indicated in the first and in the second mantra and now to this rishi angiras we found the renowned householder mahashala the one who is really great so to he, he approaches rishi angiras with a question and there was a term which we were expounding in the last class that is vidhivat it's not that suddenly seeing a renowned person just to have to ask a question and i go and just out of curiosity i ask a question it doesn't indicate that the word vidhivat entails that already shonaka has developed the qualifications needed for brahma jigyasa to <clears throat> enquire about the knowledge of brahman so that after intellectually conceiving it one have the motivation to internalize that knowledge to make it the be all and end all of his existence so that the knowledge becomes the uh, in the words of swami vivekananda that it becomes a nervous association that it becomes a part of his stimuli response conditioning he starts responding to the stimuli in a totally different pattern and that also not by using his will power the realization brings a type of spontaneity it just happens just the way spontaneously we respond to the stimuli at present in a particular way which speaks of our identification with the body mind complex we find for a man of realization that stimuli response conditioning has been transformed a sense of detachment has developed he is no more responding to the stimuli the way he used to when he was in the realm of ignorance so that's what the word vidhivat means that he has already followed certain injunctions and what are the injunctions that we were studying in the last class we were studying in the last class elaborately that the requisite spiritual disciplines are the first 
Vedadhyayana. Vedadhyayana means to study the scriptures. Why it is important? Because that opens up the portal of a knowledge which is beyond the mind and senses. All the knowledge which we resort to in, in our present life is, with, is relative to the mind and senses. It is something which is beyond that. But it is not something which is irrelevant because on that, all the knowledge of uh, which we avail through our mind and senses, all that knowledge is a merely a projection of that absolute knowledge. So that absolute knowledge of which the entire universe is a projection, that's the thing which Shonaka, desirous to know about it, has approached Angirasa, the great Rishi Angirasa. So first is a Vedadhyayan, <coughs> so that this portal opens up. After that, once you are aware of the spiritual dimension of your existence, and then comes the sadhana chatushtaya, viveka, vairagya, samadamadi, sham, shat sampatti, and mukshatva. In the last class, we were studying it in details. That after the Veda Dhyayana, when you become aware of the spiritual dimension of your existence, then the viveka, the discrimination arises. What is real? What is unreal? Nitya, anitya, vastu, viveka. Vastu, vichara, viveka. That what is permanent, what is transitory, what is going to be with me, what is going to be my nature through eternity, that nitya, anitya, all the things, all the attributes which are adhering to my, to the essence of my personality, which are just a flow, which goes on changing, they're all anitya. So nitya, nitya, anitya, vastu, vichara, viveka. So when that viveka develops, from that comes vairagya. Once you know that what is real and what is unreal, your dispassion for the unreal is bound to ensue. So that speaks of vairagya, renunciation. And once that dispassion develops, now comes the practice of samadamadi shat sampatti. Some six practices. What are they? Shama, dhamma, then comes uh, uparati, titiksha, samadhana, sraddha. So these are the six practices which follows the vairagya. Sama means calming down the mind. Don't allow the mind to break into desires. First comes that. After that, the restraining of the external organs. Just as we were saying, we can never think of applying the brake of a car unless we have uh, stopped pressing the accelerator. I cannot just go on pressing the accelerator and at the same time press the brake. First, I have to release the accelerator. That speaks of disjunction of my mind from the constant hankering of the objects of the senses. Then comes the dhamma, the, the restraint. Then comes the break. I have to stop the karmendriyas and the ganendriyas from getting involved with the external objects. And then comes uparati. It's not easy. By little practice, I may feel that I have succeeded, but I will find the old ways of life are tormenting. It comes back again and again. And I have to be persevering in my practice. Again, I have to start afresh as if and practice the summer dhamma. This constant fluctuation uh, from summer and dhamma, constant divergence from summer and dhamma. For that, again and again, that uparati has to be practiced. Cessation of the sense organs, already restrained by summer and dhamma. And then comes titiksha. For all these practices, it entails, to a certain extent, suffering. It do entail suffering, but we have to be patiently forbearing all the suffering which entails from our spiritual practices without any complaint, without any anguish, 
without the concern that i don't know what is going to happen to me so all those things speaks of the disturbance of the mind the mind becomes more turbulent just by worrying about the future as in english very nicely it has been uh, uh, quoted what is that quotation that worrying is like a rocking chair you do something but go nowhere you are sitting in a rocking chair and rocking you are doing something but in the same place you are rocking you go nowhere all our worries are like that it's of no avail what will happen to me just by worrying that can i change the course of my life no in no way i can change so why the use what's the use of just worrying instead of worrying why not through uparati i go back to my practice whatever suffering it entails i forbear knowing it well it is just a passing phase in no time through my practice i will develop a sufficient adequate uh, control over my mind over my senses and then peace will ensue the mind will calm down the agitation will stop and that will enter in the fifth practice the samadhana samadhana means that the concentration of the mind that which leads to samadhi samadhana and for all this practice shraddha is essential if by seeing that my mind is going back to my old ways i think these are of no avail the words of the scriptures are of no use they are just something superfluous words which as such doesn't have any practical implication if i disbelieve that as the process is not something which is going to happen in a day it's not like instant coffee it has its own time i have to have that patience perseverance and how that patience perseverance comes through shraddha having faith in the words of the scripture of the guru they have told me that persevere don't get disheartened let the practice go on gradually the change you will come so if i have shraddha in the words of the guru and the scriptures then only the other practices are possible and again the fourth the last practice is the mumukshutta yearning unless i have a real yearning for the spiritual illumination there can never be this uh, this all the other practices are in no way possible you won't get the motivation to do it so that's why that mumukshutta has been spoken of as the, in the last but not the least that is the most important factor that unless i had have yearning other practices cannot even start i won't get the motivation to do it so those are the practices which speaks of that vidhi so that what we studied in the last class now today the second line is very important on which the entire upanishad rotates that's what's the line kasminnu bhagavo vikyati sarvam idam vikyatam bhavati iti that oh bhagavan knowing knowing what's that by knowing which everything becomes known kasminnu bhagavo vikyate by knowing which sarvam idam everything what i see idam in this world vikyatam becomes known bhavati iti it becomes known so that's the question now this question suddenly you, you may feel that from where that question comes we shouldn't forget that shaunaka has already followed the vidhis he has followed he has straight the he has studied the scripture he has studied the vedas and in the vedas that portal that that the spiritual portal has opened up he knows as a, as has been mentioned in the agama in the scripture that brahman is the source of the entire existence from which the entire existence has been projected so these are the thing which he has studied in the vedas in the upanishads so he has studied the agama so now to really relate to that knowledge that he has studied it but at the same time he doesn't have sufficient understanding to intellectually conceive it and after conceiving to make it the be all and end all of his existence 
So that's why though he has studied, from that study he has came to know that there is something which is being projected as the universe. So from Agama he came to know, not only that, there is Anumana, there are so many ways of knowledge. Inference, what's the inference? That when I see that all the ornaments which are made of gold, all the ornaments which are made of gold, the essence is the gold. What is the difference? Difference is only in Nama Rupa. The necklace has a particular name, it has a particular shape. The earring has a particular name, has a particular shape. So the bracelet has a particular name, has a particular shape, but all are in essence gold. The difference is only in the name and form. As Sri Ramakrishna told, used to say that uh, there was some, someone has developed a sculpture, a model of the entire village where there are many houses, there's a school building, there's a small uh, healthcare center and all other things which constitutes the village, the agricultural field. So here the person who has built up that model he has made it with wax. So everything is actually in a sense wax. The difference is only in the name and the form. So this from Anumana, from inference, we know that in this world, whenever we develop something from that, from clay, we are developing so many things. Pots, uh, the, what do you say, the various type of utensils, pots, we are making from clay. So clay is the essence, everything, the difference is only in the name and form. So is there anything from that inference is asking that something from which the universe has projected. In essence, it is the same. The differentiation lies only in the name and form. So that's from Agama as well as from Anumana. This question is something which is obvious. And that's what Shonak is asking. As we will find in the Chanda Kyubanishad, in the, in the fourth mantra of the first chapter in the sixth part of Chanda Upanishad. What's the mantra? That's the same idea which we were discussing. That yatha somya ekena, yatha somya ekena mrit pindena, sarvang mrinmayang vigyatam syat. Oh Somya, oh the good looking one. It's Somya means good looking one, who, or the one whose mind is pure. Somya, oh Somya. The teacher is instructing Shwetaketu, the student, that just the way Mritpinda, with a lump of clay, all the things that are made of clay is Mrinmaya. Mrinmaya means Mritmaya, is nothing but clay. It is maya, maya means pervading. Whenever you use the word maya in Sanskrit, that means pervading. Chin maya, pervaded with consciousness. Similarly, mrin maya, it is pervaded, pervaded by clay. Anything which is made of clay is pervaded by clay. Vigyatam syat. You know it for certain. You know it for certain that anything which is made of clay is pervaded by clay. Then what is the difference between the two objects which is made of clay? Vacha Rambhanam Vikara Namadheya. Which it is Vacha Rambha. It is only mere usage of words. Vikara. It's just the transformation. It's clay in a particular way transforms. And I name it in a particular way. Namadheya. And what's the reality in it? Mrittika ityeva satyam. It is only the lump of clay, the earth, that alone is the reality. So this is the idea which is we find even in the Upanishads. Shaunaka, as he is approaching Angirasa Vidhivat, so naturally, obviously, he has studied all those things. And from that, he got the idea that there is something which is being projected as the universe. Sarvamidam all the sense-perceived objects of the world. 
So that's what in the non-dual Vedanta, we find this idea that how the world has come into existence. There are various vadas. One is Parinama Vada. It is believed by the Sankhyas that there's a real transformation has happened. Just the way the milk gets converted into yogurt. That is Parinama. But in Vedanta, the idea is not Parinama. What it is? Adhyasa. It is Adhyasa Vada, not Parinama. Something appearing as something else. And in Vedanta, the common example, a rope is lying on the ground. In the twilight hours, I see it as a snake. Or even I may see it as a crack in the ground. I may see it variedly because of ignorance. What happened? Because of the darkness. First, the real knowledge has been obscured. That speaks of Avarana. And when the real knowledge has been obscured, it results in Vikshepa. It appears as something else. Avarana, Vikshepa. First, the knowledge of the rope is obscured. That is Avarana. And then it is projected as the snake. That is a weak shape. So the Vedanta says that the absolute reality is appearing as the world because of Adhyasa. There is no real change. In no way the absolute reality is being affected. Under all conditions, it is as it is. All the changes, all the things which I see as this world of name and form is a mere projection. And now this speaks of the tenet, uh, one of the main tenets of Vedanta. Swami Vivekananda in one of his lecture very nicely have indicated it. To quote him, one peculiarity of the Hindu mind is that it always inquires for the last possible generalization, leaving the details to be worked out afterwards. So they're not bothered about the details. Just to give an, just to again resort to that example. If I know that the snake which I am seeing is actually the rope, then is the details of the snake of any use? The snake is mere a projection. Why should I go for the details of it? Once I know that it is a projection of the rope, Till I know that this is a projection of the rope, all the details do have value. That Vyavaharika Satta, sat, Satya, that for our day to day, uh, our, for practical purposes, our day to day uses, day to day practical purposes, they have some value as long as we are in the realm of ignorance. But as per the absolute reality is concerned, as per our real existence is concerned, which in no way is going to be affected. That has no value, the details has no value. That's why Vedanta is again and again stressing to go beyond the ignorance and to get established in that real knowledge. Once you get established in that, all the panorama, it immediately just collapses. No more it has any utilitarian purpose. And then you are free. So this is the basic idea in Vedanta, again and again, it will be stressed and spoken of. So here also, there's the same thing we find. The Sarvamidam, what that Sarvamidam is, what it is, we are not bothered that as it is a projection of something, why to go for the details of that projection? Let us try to find out what is being projected as that. And once I know that, the delusion falls off. And that entails liberation. So that's why that's this sense-perceived world is of no uh, use to a Vedanta. It has no purpose as such. Its only purpose is to take us beyond the delusion through the process of Adhyarupa, Apavada, through the process of Apavada. That what I am seeing has is because of Adhyarupa, is because of some superimposition through apavada i can through the de superimposition i can again get established in my true nature so that's the idea which we find in the third mantra which has been enunciated but what's that knowing which everything 
becomes known. It's very interesting. Now, generally to this type of question, even we would have said it's Brahman by knowing which everything becomes known. The Guru might have just, Angirasa might, might have replied in one word. There was no need for the elaboration of the entire Upanishad. Instead of doing that, he never gives a direct answer to that question. What he answers appears to be something which appears to be queer. It's not the exact answer to the question. It apparently appears that he is answering something which is in no way related to the question. So let us go to that mantra and then we'll try to understand why he is answering in this fashion. The fourth mantra of the first chapter of the first part of Mundaka Upanishad. The next mantra. Tasmai sa huvaja. Being asked so, he said to him, Tasmai sa ha uvaja. Tasmai sa huvaja. Dwe vidwe vedi tavye iti hasma. There are two types of knowledge that has to be acquired. Yat brahma vido vadanti. Those, the knower of the Brahman, they speak of two types of knowledge that have to be acquired. Both have to be acquired. Dwe vidye vedi tavye iti hasma brahma vido vadanti. What are those two knowledge? Paracha eva aparacha. Paracha eva paracha. Paracha eva aparacha. One is para, higher knowledge. So in, you find these words, Sanskrit words, sometimes if you try to relate with our original language, it becomes easy to understand. Just in Hindi say, ye sabke par mein hai. Sabke par. Par means supreme. So para means higher, beyond which nothing is there, which transcends everything. And apara, the lower, that which is not para. So there are two types of knowledge, higher knowledge and lower knowledge. So <clears throat> now the question comes that why, that objection, that when he has asked that what is that by knowing which everything becomes known, to that question, this can never be the answer. But we should first understand that who is answering? He is a Brahmavid, the knower of Brahman. So if we have Sraddha, that yes, he is an authentic person. Why is an authentic person? Because he has followed the tradition, his Paramparavid, he knows the tradition. And following the tradition, he went to the realization. So that's why he's authentic. Just the way when I am sick, I go to the doctor and doctor prescribed me some medicine. I have sraddha. I don't question that why you have prescribed this medicine. I simply go buy that medicine and I take that medicine. Knowing fully well what? The same, that this doctor has followed the parampara. There's a long research for years together going on in the medical science. That's our what, that's what the, a medical student has to study. They have to follow the parampara. It's not that he has just by himself written, uh, read some books and proclaimed him to be a doctor like the quacks we find. He's not a quack. He's a registered, licensed doctor. He has studied the course. It's a long course. He has followed the parampara. And after studying, he has got established in that medical knowledge. And now he is an authentic person. So when I go uh, to approach him, if I don't have sraddha, if I start doubting the doctor, as many will be say that in Bengali they say, doctori, that we somehow have the habit of trying to drive the car sitting on the rear seat. So many of us do that. And then we find that medical science is of no avail. But going to the doctor, if you go to the dietitian and just start instructing him that, uh, that what all diet you are taking and how it is good instead of taking his suggestion. Because going to the dietitian is of no evil. So that sraddha is required that yes, here he's a Brahmavit. He's saying something. It must have some implication. That though the question is 
that what is that knowing which everything is known when he replies who is replying it is not some lay person yat brahma vido vadanti he is a brahma vid in the question in response to this question what is replying there are two types of knowledge para cha eva apara cha why he is replying that way very interesting why because the moment when you ask a question that what is that by knowing which everything becomes known we at present with our state of existence what's our idea is that all knowledge has to be acquired by the mind and the senses that's what we have knowledge we have that i go to the laboratory my senses through the senses i am just perceiving what's going on with the senses through the mind and by accessing the knowledge the accessing the information and processing them then in the mind the processing of the knowledge which i have already accessed through my senses the knowledge is acquired so i may have an idea that brahma vidya also is something which has to be acquired just the way in the same way i acquire all the knowledge through my mind and through my senses so here if he says that brahman if i say that brahman has, is the one who is being projected as the universe by knowing which everything can be known now immediately i will think show me brahman so here just to take the necessary precautionary measure that immediately that one word answer won't be of any avail the guru is first making him angiras is first making him aware that don't think all knowledges can be acquired through the mind and the senses there are two types of knowledge there is a type of knowledge which is beyond the realm of the mind and senses that's the higher knowledge that's not even in the purview of the vedas because the vedas i study it is my through the perception of the senses i am studying the vedas i am uh what you say that having a conception of it conceiving it through my mind so it is something beyond that even beyond the vedas that's the para everything all other things are apara all other knowledge is something which are uh, for which to acquire which i have to use my mind and senses they are the criteria through which i can acquire knowledge they are all apara why he is saying that just as we told that to make us understand to make us aware of the fact that there is some knowledge which is beyond the purview of mind and senses now here comes science to say these are all bogus knowledge has to be the standpoint of all knowledge is the mind and the senses what i see what i conceive that alone is knowledge everything else is mere trash now you know very interesting there are so many ways you can suddenly become spiritual a wonderful fact is that many of the astronomers who went to the space suddenly you go out of this so called this small world which is the be all and end all of existence go to the space and see this little world where this life is there we find that we are so a tiny existence in the entire cosmos and suddenly it helps them that just going to the space what happens suddenly their mind gets detached it's very natural but when you go out of this humdrum seeing the world uh, compared to the entire space you find that how small our existence is a sense of detachment develops and the key point the key to all spirituality is a detachment and it gives them to certain extent a spiritual it opens up the spiritual portal for many of the astronomers the astronomers are the one who are the product of science it is the scientists who have decided to venture the space and these astronomers have been trained for that and when they just go to the space they becomes a bit spiritualistic they they become very spiritual and one of the very great astronomer his name is 
Arthur Eddington, Sir Arthur Eddington, in his book, The Philosophy of Physical Science, he is giving him a wonderful analogy to explain that all the knowledge which we have through the mind and senses is not the be all and end all of all we know. There is something beyond that. Just to claim that anything which is not perceivable by our mind and senses doesn't exist is like what the wonderful analogy is giving. Suppose <clears throat> you're exploring the life of the ocean, that what all life is there on the ocean. A person, a biologist is exploring the life of the ocean and he casts a net into the water, throws a net into the water and, and he then pulls back the net. He brings up his catch and he just studies the catch. He surveys the catch and then he comes to a decision. What's that? That there is no sea creature which is legs less, which is smaller than two inch. It's all the smallest size is two inch. All other creatures are bigger than that. The minimum size of any ocean creature is two inch. And all sea creatures have gills. So now, would you say his knowledge is correct? Yes, his knowledge is correct in one way that whatever he has caught is, of course, is not shorter than two inch and they all have gills. But the question is, what about the catch itself? What about the net by which you are catching? The nets, each, the, the dimension of the uh, holes of each net, of the net, the space uh, in, uh, uh, of the, each of those holes in the net is something two inch. So naturally, anything smaller than two inch has to pass through it. And now you have the catch and say that no creature in the ocean is smaller than two inch. So is your knowledge correct? So what a nice example Arthur Eddington is uh, illustrating in his book, The Philosophy of Physical, uh, this Physical Science. That's what the mistake we are doing. That our senses and the mind is like that fish, fishers, fisher, fisherman's net it has particular dimension. It has certain limitations. It has to work within those limitations. And to say that what I see through my senses, what I perceive through my mind alone is true. Everything is, is false. Is just like that fisherman, that biologist who says that there is no sea creature lesser than two inch long and they all have gills. So does our sensual knowledge which is streamlined by the mind and senses cannot be the entire gamut of knowledge. And that is the thing which Angiras wants to point out to Sonaka. That wait, don't be in such a hurry that to just you have studied the scripture and you think I will just like a scripture give you a multiple choice question you are asking and I give you the correct answer. It is not that easy. So to make Sonaka aware of the fact that his question cannot be answered from the perspective of sensual perceptions, it cannot be answered, but he has to transcend it. So Angiras points out that there are two types of knowledge, paravidya and aparavidya, higher knowledge and lower knowledge. After saying that, now he will illustrate what is higher knowledge and what is lower knowledge. In the fifth mantra, what is the higher knowledge and what is the lower knowledge? First he will describe the lower knowledge, all the gamut of knowledge, so-called academic knowledge that was available in those days has been spoken of as the lower knowledge. Let's read the mantra. Tatra apara. That let's speak of the apara, the lower knowledge. What? Rigveda, Yajurveda, Sama Veda, Atharva Veda, Shiksha Kalpo. Vyakarana, Nirukta, Chanda, Jyotisha. So what are these apara? Rigveda, Yajurveda, Samaveda, Atharvaveda. The four Vedas 
so this veda the word veda nowadays we think that a particular book but actually the word veda came from vid dhatu vid means to know and veda means knowledge encyclopedia veda actually means encyclopedia that all knowledge is encompassed just as the way in the you know that we have this encyclopedia which has all the available fund of knowledge so veda also means encyclopedia all the knowledge in those days which the rishis have discovered discovered means this words are so important the vedas are they say apurusha apurusha means there is no author that knowledge cannot be patented the rishis were humble enough to admit to the fact that knowledge cannot be patented because knowledge is already there when i say newton discovered gravitation was gravitation not there before newton it was there that was there what newton did he just removed the cover of the ignorance discovered and we all came to know about gravitation similarly the rishis that's why you will find in the entire vedas most of the places the rishis names are not mentioned because they felt that this knowledge is just a discovery it is already there i am not the author of it so this fund of knowledge in those days it actually means whether means actually encyclopedia it is a power to share these words we will find so many ways of interpretation but the real meaning is that knowledge cannot be patented that is that's why it is no purusha has is the author of it a purusha it is universal it is always there the rishis only discovered it and that's the collection of that knowledge this encyclopedia is the veda that was divided into four parts rik yaju sama atharva so what are these vedas the rik is the as you know that when we write something sometimes it can be written in poem it can be written in prose form it can be set to music or this can be used for our this knowledge can have some utilitarian value it can be used for our day to day our various uh, day to day activities that knowledge can be used in the form of technology the same thing rigveda speaks of the mantras rhymed in meters is the poetry sama the mantras which were meant for singing sama veda sama was sung yajur veda yeah the mantras are in the prose form and atharva veda had the utilitarian value that all the details of the rituals like upanayana that initiation into learning marriage ceremony funerals all the rituals pertaining to that comes from the atharva veda and even some speak of the magic all sorts of uh, the dark knowledge that's also it's also has some utility as atharva veda all the utilitarian knowledge is atharva veda so this was the entire gamut of knowledge but now to study this encyclopedia of knowledge you should have some preliminary skills you cannot just directly enter into to study the encyclopedia why just even in the present to go to the higher knowledge first we have in the junior classes we have to develop certain skills so that when we go to the higher classes or to the university we can understand with the base on the basis of all the things which you have learned in school so in those days <clears throat> these vedas are the something which was to be studied in the university now before that in the school to study that vedas to understand those vedas there are six auxiliaries vedangas that had to be studied first unless you have studied those six vedangas auxiliaries to the vedas it is almost impossible to understand the vedas so what are those auxiliaries which first has to be studied that also is included in the aparavidya what are they shiksha kalpa vyakarana nirukta chanda jyotisha these are the six so what are they this shiksha shiksha is the science of pronunciation 
it is very important in sanskrit that if you mispronounce the entire meaning will change the total meaning changes there are so many words just just a little mispronunciation will change the meaning so the science of pronunciation was very important in the vedas though the spelling may be same but the way you pronounce that will give different meanings so that's why the siksha deals is the science of pronunciation that when you are studying the vedas how to pronounce the word that whether the syllable is udat anudat so all these signs was indi- is mentioned in the auxiliary called shiksha kalpa is the signs of rituals you have to pronounce the mant- mantras correctly and then you should know the signs of the rituals to do the yagyas and the third thing is vyakaran the grammar unless you know the grammar again it is almost impossible to decipher the meaning of the vedas so shiksha kalpa vyakarana <clears throat> next comes the nirukta nirukta means the etymological meaning of words to know the etymological meaning of the words is something very essential to understand the philosophy of the vedas throughout the world if you have to if you find if you can know that how the words have evolved just by having the knowledge of how the words evolved you can have the knowledge of the philosophy of that society just jokingly we say so many times that in bengali we say that if any child is not very intelligent is a bit dull we say kabla buddhu just how inside the word the what is the in the inherent meaning is hidden that what very interesting that in sankhya philosophy they say that when you get liberated when you go beyond the mind you reach the state of kevala then you realize that you alone exist as the conscious principle by your own right you don't need the crutch of the mind and senses so kevala purusha so from the kevala purusha the word kaivalya came you reach the state of kevala so you are kaivalya when it happens when you go beyond the mind and this child is a bit dull his mind doesn't work so he's already beyond the mind so it is an ironical statement but see even in such queer words slang words the philosophy is hidden the entire sankhya philosophy's idea is hidden in that small word kabla that this boy seems has no mind he has already gone beyond the mind because he has reached the state of kaivalya so he is kabla buddhu he has become buddha he has gone beyond the state of mind like buddha so his mind that nirvana nirvana is the stopping of the mind and the senses the mind and the senses has been extinguished that takes you to the realization so he has gone beyond the mind and senses this is buddhu so just we will find that then this chitta vritti chitta vritti the word vritti we we loosely translate as the mind the waves of the mind but the word vritti doesn't mean waves it means profession a doctor's vritti is that's he is a doctor engineer's vritti is he is an engineer his profession then why this chitt the word vritti has been used again you will find the philosophy is hidden that just the way my profession sustains me a doctor sustains himself by his profession an engineer sustains himself by his profession a businessman sustains himself by his profession whatever may be the profession similarly the mind can be sustained as long as the waves are there if the waves are not there immediately it will go to the the chitta vritti nirodha that what's the next thing happens swa swarupe avasthanam you get established in your real nature it is only the vritti which sustaining the mind not allowing to go beyond the mind so now you will understand the word vritti though it means profession but we are using for the waves why because this is the the waves of the mind are like the profession of the mind by which the mind is sustained the mind otherwise won't be sustained it falls off so now you will understand 
to know the etymological meaning of the words is so important it gives you the entire philosophy so that was a branch of the science called nirukta where the etymological meaning of the words was studied chhanda now in sanskrit the rhyming is not like the rhyming of uh, english poems you can say in english poem also of course there is a, there's a rhyming with meters but mainly in other cultures we find rhyming is by ending a sentence with the same type of word as in the previous sentence so if it is cat then the next sentence ends with bat so like that but in sanskrit the rhyming was wonderful it's not the last word by which they used to rhyme they'll find exact number of syllables in each phrase just like bhagavad gita almost the entire bhagavad gita not all a few are of different chanda but 99% of the shlokas of bhagavad gita is anushtup chanda what's that there are total four f- phrases in each shloka two lines each line has two phrases so total comes four phrases and each phrase will have exactly eight syllable exactly eight syllable and that is anushtup chanda and these are the chandas even now you will find in the western world the students uh, even the westerns in so many schools they are going for this memorizing of these shlokas because they find it is this rhyming not of the words last word rhyming of the syllable which actually nourishes our memory the faculty of memory gets very strong when you try to memorize anything in with proper meters and they have I was knowing that science now we'll find that in germany in many other western countries that they have made a part of their syllabus they're studying this sanskrit uh, shlokas they're chanting and that itself was a science this chanda in meters the gayatri the gayatri is, is actually not only one mantra gayatri is actually a chanda what that chanda is that there will be three in each uh, mantra there will be three phrases and each phrase again will have eight syllables and very interesting there are so many gayatris the mantra which we know as gayatri is an exception of gayatri there is not exactly eight syllable in all the phrases there is an exception of gayatri but that has become famous as gayatri so very very interesting so any mantra like just as we, we say that uh, uh, just for uh, ramakrishna we have our made our gayatri that what's that ramakrishna ay vidmahe gadadharaya dhimahi tanno hansa prachodayat so if you see there will be exactly eight syllables in each of this three line it actually speaks of worshiping the spirit by the spirit all the gayatri mantras are indicated for that the first line indicates the external form the seven i say ramakrishna ay vidmahe ramakrishna ay vidmahe exactly eight gadadharay dhimahi exactly eight tanno hansa prachodayat exactly eight so what actually this gayatri speaks of any gayatri i'm just taking this it immediately came to my mind the first line speaks of the external form that i see i know it vidmahi means i know but through my mind and senses what i know is not the exact knowledge it is just a projection behind it is its real reality that i am dhimahi that i am meditating upon the real reality just like for the uh durga mantra also the same thing that uh kanya kumari dhimahi uh, katyayanaya dhimahi katyayanaya vidmahi means the durga is the daughter of rishi katyayana so that is the outer form that is the physical form but that is not the reality she is actually kanya kumari means eternal virgin god can not in no way be tarnished nothing can affect that absolute reality so kanya kumari just just doesn't mean a small girl a girl who is ever virgin 
Nothing can contaminate the absolute reality. Nothing can, as Ramakrishna used to say, the sun, in the light of the sun, someone is studying the scripture, someone is forging, counterfeiting the coins. Does the sun get affected? No. So similarly, the absolute reality, nothing can contain. From that, the universe has been project, projected. So when I see it as a feminine form, it is the eternal virgin. Kanya, that's the real. The Katyayana actually is Kanya Kumari, the absolute reality. Tanno Durgi Prachodayat. Durgi means to overcome the obstacles through tapas. I have the faculty of tapas through which I can get rid of all the obstacles which is hindering my realization. So I invoke that strength within me. So it is a worship of the spirit by the spirit, all the Gayatris. So just see, and this Chanda was used in the entire Vedas. It's a wonderful science, the various meters used for rhyming. So unless you know these Chandas, it, again, it becomes very difficult to enter into the study of the Vedas. So because each Chanda resorts to particular type of intonations. And from that, you can get a broad knowledge and then you can go to the specific meaning. So Chandas, the various meters used for rhyming. And lastly, the Jyotisha, the astrology to calculate the exact times of various Yajyas. It was so developed. Even now we marvel the Jyotisha. It was so developed. You know that so, so many practices were there that after marriage, uh, you have to see that the particular star, huh? Arundhati, the Arundhati star has to be seen. I was reading somewhere very interesting that Arundhati, why? It is actually two nakshatras. Generally, we have the idea that the, uh, there are so many sun, like our sun, around which the planets are moving. That's our idea that the entire universe constitutes of so many, the solar system as if the solar system again constitutes a galaxy. But just see the rishis has such a minute observation. They found that Arundhati and the star which is accompanying it, Vashishta and Arundhati, they, these are the two stars, Vashishta and Arundhati, both are encircling each other. No one is static. That just generally we have the idea, the olden idea was that the husband is the one who is the center and the wife has to revolve around it. Whatever the whims and fancies of the husband is, the wife has to follow. To negate that idea, they have to see that after the marriage, the Arundhati's that and the Vashishta, that star has to be seen to make them aware of the fact that their lives are, are going to be complementary. They both have to complement each other. No one is greater, no one is smaller. Both have an important role. There has to be a synergy. There has to be a win-win situation for the marriage to really fructify, to, to really give you fulfillment, to take you to further spiritual evolution. There has to be complement, they have to complement each other. Just see Jyotisha. It is after the marriage, that star has to be seen. So you have to have the knowledge, they've calculated the exact time, when it can be seen, how it can be seen. And accordingly, the dates of marriages are fixed. There are sometimes you cannot see the Arundhati star in the sky. So most probably those are the dates which are avoided. The date are kept on those dates when it can be seen. So from that, the wonderful science of Jyotisha developed. So just see, these are the auxiliaries after studying which now you resort to the study of the Vedas. But these all, the Vedas had this, this, what, uh, this Upanishad is a part of Veda. This is a, one of the unique characteristic of the Vedas. All scriptures say that for the way to God is the scripture, believe in scripture. Vedas are the only, only scripture which say you have to go beyond the Vedas. These are all upper, lower. So these all, which you have, this pursuit of knowledge through the mind and the senses is apara. Then what is para? Atha para, yaya, tad aksharam adhigamyati. That higher knowledge is that which, by which we can know the akshara. Akshara means that which is 
mutable is kshara. Akshara means that it is immutable. That which is immutable is the only sat in Sanskrit. Sat is described as trikala vadita, whose existence is not interrupted by any phase of time, past, present, future. It is always there as in the eternal present with no change. That's the akshara. So one, that which takes us to that adhigamana. This, this Sanskrit words are so interesting. Gamyate means to go, to physically travel from one space to another space. Adhigamana is very interesting. Adhigamana is not physically going from one place to other. It is actually getting established. Just sitting in one place, suddenly your ignorance falls off. The knowledge reveals. You're totally transformed as if you have traveled, not in space, not in space, but in time. In that ignorance has fallen off and in time I have traveled, sitting in the same place, relating to some higher dimension of my reality. And that is the para. So this para vidya that this has been spoken of, that actually transcends the Vedas. Now the question comes, if anything which is transcends the Vedas, how can it be the highest knowledge? It has no base. Its authenticity is gone. The script it is something we are saying beyond the scriptures. But here comes the beauty of the idea that what it actually means, that going beyond the Vedas, Aksharam, that Shankaracharya will be nicely contending to that idea, that in no way that this, that any knowledge which is outside the Vedas is futile and unacceptable. If you say, it's actually will be a wrong way to understand what is being indicated here. What actually it indicates, just today the time is over, just a common, uh, with an example you will understand. You have not tasted the mango, you have studied about the taste of mango. And that impels you, that motivates you to taste the mango. Now, till you have not tested the mango, all the knowledge was bookish knowledge. You were a knowledgeable person. You could have given a uh, one hour lecture on the test of mango. We have studied so many books. But the day you test the mango, the knowledge which comes reveals from it. Would you agree it has transcended all the knowledge which you have studied? In no way you can relate that knowledge with so many superfluous words. You can relate to that. So here also when it says that tat aksharam adhigamyate, it actually speaks of realization. Here again, Veda asserts to the fact that scriptures are not meant for mere make-belief. That you have to believe this, then you are liberated. No. Seeing is believing. You have to realize so that the knowledge becomes karatala amulakavat. Just like the way you have a fruit in your hand, you're seeing it as palpable as that. The knowledge becomes palpable unless and until that has happened. Knowledge is of no avail. That alone can help us to overhaul our personality, to become a jivan mukta. Unless that has happened, it's only mere intellectual academic knowledge. That's of no avail. And to establish this idea, this idea that this, the concept of paravidya, which has to be, we have to transcend and mind, our mind and senses to get established in that knowledge. It must be done. If we really want to make our life meaningful. So to indicate that, this line has been indicated. We will again continue with the discussion of this significant phrase around which the entire Upanishad is actually, will be revolving. Atha para yayatad aksharam adhigamyate. We will just have a bit more elucidation of this line before we proceed to the next mantra. So with this, we stop our discussion today. Thank you all. Namaskars.